here in, in Delhart. And the fact that it's totally completely inadequate and and has been since long before Kevin was the mayor and and that's fine. We're going to check it. We've talked about it. And so I go into committee, and they want to amend the enabling legislation for the joint resolution to take money from severance tax and put it in transportation, $800 to $900 a year. It's not as big a deal as it seems. It's a dedicated stream, which has some importance, but it's really only 10 to 15% of total tax dollars funding. It's not magic. And I said, now wait a minute. I said, I just talked to Mayor of Dalhart, and we've talked about this underpass, 13 feet 7 inches, which does not meet modern standards of, of, of freight carriage. And I said they've been waiting, they've been told all these things by TxDOT, and there's still nothing done. And I said now, we, we realize where we are compared to I-35 and a mile roadway on I-35 compared with state highway. We get that. But at the same time, now, what it looks like to us is we're now going to move behind I-35 to I-35 and the ports on the coast. We had a discussion, kind of an argument about the importance of, of deep water ports in the state of Texas. They are very important. They're essential to trade and they're essential to agricultural and industrial trade. And I understand that. But they also produce a lot of income of their own and they have other funding sources. We've got tech stop for highways. And... Uh, and the chairman spoke up, and, and as you can imagine, when the chairman of finance speaks up, it, it, it says a lot. And, and we have this little argument about ports, and okay, okay, okay. And uh, I said, my problem is not ports, it's my problem is priorities. And you can only move state highways and farm market roads so down on this priorities, which means they become no priority at all. And the chairman said, we're going to get something done on that. He's been up through here. That's when all the phone calls started, and, and it's just... It doesn't always work that well, that smoothly, or that quickly, but it's a case where somebody in the local jurisdiction calls up and we can get something done because, quite frankly, that's why we're there. And, and I think it's going to go very well. <clears throat> the district engineer guy and I are going to talk about Highway 54 here right away um, because, you know, TxDOT's policy really is to tell folks that they're going to get something done and that's supposed to suffice for some certain period of time. And that really, what good is that? Um, so we're going to address that. And, and I think they mean well. They do good road work when they get around to doing it. But this is a big state. And all parts of the state must be served. Because all parts of the state are paying into the coffers. When we talk about the coffers, the most important thing we do every two years is a budget. It's about, hundred, I think, $192 billion, some enormous sum of money. About $192 billion. And, and that figure goes up. It seems almost impossible to have the Constitution of the United States or the state of Texas amended to where it says um, spending growth cannot exceed population growth and inflation. Those are drivers of budgets, and, and they do go up, and that's fine. Here's the most important thing. While it's not in the amendment of, while it's not in the Constitution of the state of Texas, our fiscal growth over the last 10 years and in this year are staying under inflation and population growth. And, and that's important. We're lucky in that the, that the economy of the state of Texas is growing and provides more funding to account for about 400 some odd thousand additional people a year, uh, 65 to 78 thousand more kids in school. And uh, everything is more expensive than last year. But I think we're staying within those parameters for economic growth and, or spending growth. We're about a half a billion dollars below the constitutional spending limit. So it's a pretty restrained budget. There's budgetary growth, yeah. But there's growth in the state of Texas that affects every single area. Public education, higher education, unfortunately criminal justice, Medicaid, all those things. Uh, the single most important thing that we do in the legislature, I think, and our funding, number one funding priority, is public education. Um, and, and no, where's that more, more obvious than, than here in Dallas County, where you all have a very good school system. It's very well led, and, 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 and the public supports it. Um, we put $3.6 billion of money back into public ed after cutting that money in 2011, and I think that's, that's particularly important. Um, we have done some really significant things in terms of policy. The, the best bill 
I think, filed before the last session was Senate Bill 225. The reason I think it is the best bill, it was because it was my bill. And that bill eventually became House Bill 5, but it takes the tax test, it takes the STAR test, that, that replaced the tax test, which is a good thing. It takes that from 15 tests to five required tests. 15 tests came about in another piece of legislation of mine because educators said if we're going to do, if our STAR test is going to essentially do essentially for our accountability system what a semester test was, you're normally going to see 14 tests. I don't know where the 15th came from. So that's why it was 15 tests. What we found out was for an accountability system, in courses where kids are being tested anyway, it's just too many tests. It's more than is necessary. And so when I wrote 225, we made it five tests. A lot of people wanted to keep it eight tests. The governor wanted more than five tests. There was no reason. Let's find out what is really important to measure, to see to it that our, our school districts are doing the jobs, our campuses are doing the jobs, and characterize our students. But don't do a lot more testing. Kids are going to have to take tests anyway. And so we did away with the 15% of the STAR test that was going to be part of the grade. We did away with the, the cumulative nature of the STAR tests and, and simplified things along the lines recommended by educators. And that's an important principle because I don't do um, public ed legislation without input from educators. Now, I realize that sounds kind of simple-minded, but how many times have you seen somebody just have this great, brilliant idea in Austin and think it ought to be law without talking to the people who have to use it. it. Happens all the time. A lot of time along philosophical lines or ideological lines or something like that. But, but in this 31st district, there are 82 school districts and some people who are not only very, very dedicated, but really, really good at what they do into teaching kids in situations where it never gets any easier. Your school districts always have lots of kids, an increasing number of kids that are on free and reduced price lunch program and, and speak English as a second language. They're going to have to be tested in English and they're going to have to be brought up to speed and the school districts do a good job of doing that. And so now we've done the STAR test. We've gone through five tests and uh, are we done? I don't know. But every time we have this discussion, and I go to lots of meetings of a lot of groups, um, with administrators and teachers and things like that. We're starting now on legislation in the 2015 session. What do we need to do next? What's, what's our next real challenge? Distance learning and technology are going to be a big, big part of it. Teacher education and training are going to be a big part of it. Um, <clears throat> the list goes on and on. 